and the blood of the Lamb. And unless we speak these things out, people need to get encouraged. Unless we're boldly proclaiming the healing power of God through the airways, around the world, wherever you are, you are the light in a dark world. And so I want to encourage you to be the light. All right, we're in uh, the book of Numbers in chapter 7. We finished the last time we were together a couple weeks ago with the Aaronic benediction, the blessing of Aaron on the children of Israel. And God's instruction says you are to bless the children of Israel this way. And this way is very important because the way pours out almost like the prayer that when they said to Yeshua, how should we pray? God was giving the instruction to Moses how you should bless and how you should be blessed. And this is an order. God's a God of order. And he wants you to say to the children of Israel, and you who are grafted in become B'nai Israel. You become a child of Israel. You're grafted into the inheritance. You're adopted sons and daughters. I know about adoption. Amanda is adopted, our daughter. I know about the process, and I know about the rules and regulations about adoption. And you are given every right as if you are a natural-born child. It's given to you by the court system as if it came from heaven above. And so God says, this is how you're to bless the children of Israel. This is how you should be blessing each other. This is how you should be blessing your children. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the Hebrew, it translates, the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. The Lord bestow his favor upon you and grant you peace. What is that peace? Yeshua. He is the Prince of Peace to grant you his salvation. This is the perfect blessing. God says in this way, thus they shall link my name with the people of Israel and I will bless them. His name will be upon those that receive this blessing. Who does not want the name of God to be upon them? Who does not want to receive the name of God as their own? Not that we become little gods as much as you would like to. I know that there are religions that say that when you die, you'll get your own planet. Yikes. I wonder what my planet would look like. It'd be a mess. What would your planet look like? It'd be a mess. You know, everybody wants power and they want authority, but when you give it to them, what do they do? So God only gives us what we can handle. And so as we now have the tabernacle and we have these assignments and we have this, <clears throat> this reiteration of order, a very specific order. God has <clears throat> people assigned to various processes, not only to what they're responsible for, but the order in which they're responsible for it. Imagine taking something apart and starting with the bottom. Well, you don't. You start with the top. You you build it from the bottom up. You take it apart from the top down. And so he had an order, and he had a reverse order, and he had a forward order, and he had all these things set up so that when they moved, when they moved, you see, because somebody had to be on the lookout and say, the cloud is moving. Well, when the cloud's moving, that's the bell, that's the ringing of the bell that says, okay, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. It's time to move. We have to put this in motion. Everybody go to your post. Everybody be where you're supposed to be. I've got to count on you, and I can't be banging into you. How many of you worked in a small kitchen before? How easy is that? Okay. How many of you learned to say behind you? How many of you learned to put a gentle hand on a shoulder? How many of you learned to use a hip? How many of you learned to make a noise, to have a signal, a sign, so you weren't crashing into each other all the time? Now, we serve thousands of meals out of a very small kitchen at Bethel in Atlanta. Thousands of meals. And we had a very small crew of four people. And it was like watching people. And you expected them to, you know, like uh, Laura and I play Samurai Elevator. We started it with the kids. You all get in the four corners of the elevator. You ever do this? Okay, we call it Samurai Elevator. And all of you start running, bouncing off of walls. Okay, whatever floors you're going on, trying to avoid running into each other. Well, it's chaos and calamity. Well, we still do it even though we don't have kids. <clears throat> and I do it just because I want to get caught. Because <laughs> I don't ever avoid. 
But the whole purpose was is four of you going from four different corners and seeing how many times you could avoid each other in, in a small elevator. A lot of fun. Okay, we're a strange family. All right? We called it Samurai Elevator, and we did it wherever we went, and it was a lot of fun. Well, you know, in, in life, you tend to try to work through that, and that's a system. Well, here you have the tabernacle, and you have tens of thousands of people, all with jobs and responsibilities and having to work in perfect harmony and unity, and you don't read about all the glitches. And Are you booting up, honey? Jim Oswald, what, do you, what kind of noise did you just make? My wife pointed at you. That's the basketball player in her. You ever, you ever watch her when something happens, she goes. <laughs> I, or if there's a noise and she actually made it and she goes. <laughs> you got to keep your eye on her. She sits in the back, but, you, you know, now that we're back from Odessa, honey, the spotlight's switching, you know. <laughs> They're going to start looking. Yeah, she's like this. She goes. <laughs> but you have this very precise operation and God gave very specific instructions. Now, what's the most amazing part about this isn't the instructions. It was the execution. Because you don't read about the chaos. You don't read about the calamities and the catastrophes and the spare parts inventory and the broken this and the broken that and what the contingency plans were when this didn't work. Or, you know, well, you know, we, we uh, oh, I'm sorry, well, I didn't do my job and now we have to start all over again. You didn't read any of that because it was execution. People were assigned and they obeyed. They were assigned, they heard and they obeyed, they heard and they obeyed, they heard and they obeyed. And their hearts were in it. It wasn't because of the fear factor, it was because their heart was in it. They were completely submitted to the Lord. He's the one that had redeemed them. He's the one that delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. He took them out to this place where he could say, I will be your God and you will be my people. And I'll provide everything for you. Your clothes won't wear out. Your shoes won't wear out. You won't go hungry. You won't go thirsty. I'm going to take care of it all. You don't know where you're going, but I'm telling you where you're going. You're going to a land of milk and honey. I'm going to do all this for you. I've redeemed you from the hand of the oppressor. Why wouldn't you want to do exactly what you're told? Why wouldn't you want to go where you're told and do it to be pleasing to the one that saved your life? This is how we honor him, by hearing and obeying. Obedience, much better than sacrifice. And so now we hear in chapter 7, on, that, on the day that Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed and consecrated it in all its furnishings as well as the altar and its utensils. The very first thing he did was dedicate it back to the one that designed it. The one who put all the peace parts together, the one who called for it, now he says, I'm going to dedicate it, I'm going to consecrate it, I'm going to set it apart to you for your purpose, not for mine. Yes, it was built with his hands. Yes, it was built with the hands of man. Yes, they put all the peace parts together and they made them and manufactured them and carved them and architected them according to the instructions. Yes, they had their blood, their sweat, and their tears into it. But they all clearly acknowledged it wasn't theirs, it was his didn't belong to them because they laid their hands upon it. It belonged to him because he was the creator. And they understood their relationship with him. God bless you. Is that some Odessa stuff? Yeah. Keep it to yourself. But bless all the works of your hands. And now go wash them, please. <laughs> but you have this amazing tabernacle, this ornate, inlaid with gold and hammered and formed and handcrafted and architected in the most beautiful piece of furniture that any human being could ever imagine. But it didn't belong to them. It was consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. Upon its completion, I've been to people's homes. You get ready to move into the home, we come and consecrate the home and dedicate the home to the Lord. We speak atmospherically, spiritually, that everything that the workers left behind Got to remember, people have junk. Oh, well, nobody's ever lived in this house before, Rabbi. Why does it have to be spiritually cleansed? Well, because the wood manufacturer. Well, what about the uh, plumber and the electrician and all the people that have been walking through here and all the stuff that they've laid their hands upon? What about all that? What about what they brought with them and left behind? What about that? Why don't we go into your home and anoint your home with oil and dedicate it to the Lord and cleanse it, spiritually cleanse it? 
and then put up a mezuzah on the doorpost of your house that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be upon your heart and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house. And there it is right there. This house consecrated, anointed, and dedicated to the Lord. And all the furnishings in it, just like the tabernacle. Do we see demonic battles taking place in the Mishkan? Do we see the war going on where Satan comes with his little minions and they fight him off? No, because this is a consecrated holy place and where the Holy Spirit resides, other spirits do not dwell. This is a pattern. It belonged to the Lord. It was of the Lord. It was the Lord's instruction by man's hands. Ten commandments. By the Lord, by the hand of Moses. It doesn't belong to Moses. These aren't Moses' commandments. These are commandments of God. So we need to understand these patterns he gave us in the desert. We were in the desert for a long time. Were we aimless wanderers or were we gathering knowledge and wisdom and, and equipping ourselves for the life that was going to come out there when we were no longer isolated and set apart, when we were no longer just in the presence of God? When we went out there and we consorted with our enemies, when we went out there to take over towns and places and inhabit them, what were we supposed to do when we got there? The same thing he showed us, the pattern in the desert, consecrated, dedicated to the Lord. You buy a car, if you're not anointing that car with oil, I'm not talking about every 3,000 miles. I'm talking about the minute that you get that car, you anoint it. We sell car mezuzahs. I have one in my car. Oh, isn't that a talisman? Isn't that superstitious? No. I'm going to dedicate whatever the Lord provides for me to the Lord. Now guess what? Parking lot attendants, car wash attendants say, what's that? 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 You get to tell them. Why do I wear a star of David? Do I do it to remind myself that I'm Jewish? (laughs) That'd be pretty foolish, wouldn't it? It's like a man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like when he turns away. Okay? No, because it's a conversation. Oh, what is it? That's a beautiful piece. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's a star of David with the Holy Spirit descending on it. Oh, what's that mean? Oh, it means I'm a Jewish believer. Oh, what's that? <laughs> and not only did he consecrate it in its furnishings as well as the altar and its utensils, that meant everything in there was dedicated to the Lord. Everything, the tongs, every part of it, the bowls, everything was dedicated to the Lord because it was for sacred use. Now, isn't it interesting that our bodies today are the temple of the Lord? Do we consecrate our bodies? Do we dedicate them to the Lord? Or do we cut them, pierce them, tattoo them, not cleanse them? Do we do things to ourselves that self-inflicted wounds, cut, drink to excess, smoke, whatever it is that we're doing which is polluting the temple of the Lord? That's not a consecrated place. You know, does that mean that you shouldn't have a glass of wine? That doesn't mean that at all. Does it mean that you should never smoke a good cigar? It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that the things that we do to destroy our bodies, the things that we do that we know are not beneficial. Oh, but it's a habit or I have an addiction, I have this. Well, God can take care of that. God can work on that if you dedicate yourself to the Lord, if you dedicate yourself to that purpose. When he had anointed and consecrated them, the chieftains of Israel, the heads of the ancestral houses, namely the chieftains of the tribes, those who were in charge of enrollment drew near and brought their offering before the Lord. Six draft carts and twelve oxen, a cart for every two chieftains and an ox for each one. They were bringing offerings. Free will offerings. Above and beyond the tithe, a gift to the tabernacle. Each one in order, each one the same content. So this happens to be the longest chapter. Numbers chapter 7 is the longest chapter in the the Torah. And it's like telling the same story 12 different times, but it's really interesting. 
as people read this and they go, oh, it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, okay, so do I offer up one prayer for all of you and then that's it? Or do we pray together and God hears my prayer at the same time he hears your prayer at the same time he hears your prayer and he makes note of your prayer and he makes note of your prayer and your prayer and your prayer and yours and he writes down your name next to your prayer and even if your prayer is the same as mine, it's your name next to it and he takes you into account and he takes you into account. And what about you over there? And each and every one of you he takes into account because you matter individually. See, a congregation is a body in unity made up of many members. God takes note of every member by name. Oh, we can all collectively go into the Holy of Holies together, but we go in one at a time. We go in collectively as individuals. I mean, to picture that now. Single file or all together at once, we still go in one at a time, even though we all go in together. Every Friday night at Shabbat when the altar is open and we talk about going into the Holy of Holies, we all go in, but each one on their own. And God's showing us this pattern, that even if your prayer is the same prayer as mine, it becomes your prayer too. It's your individual prayer, and when he takes account and he looks in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's your name next to it, your very own name. Not our names together, my name's there, your name's there. How many hairs do you have on your head? Oh, did you need a cash buyer for the house? And did you need some time to prepare? To, so he sent you that person. And did you need somebody to take a look at you? Oh, he sent you that person. Did you need a little extra money, Robin, because you needed to make, to render under Caesar what belonged to Caesar? So he sent you a little bit more than what you needed because you were faithful to ask him not to worry and not to fear because he's the one who says, oh, he marks that down next to your name. And not only does he mark down the prayer request, but he marks down the praise report. See, because how many lepers were healed? Ten. Only one came back. The other nine weren't noted, were they? They were lumped together as nine ungrateful. But the one, the one who took the time to stop and come back and give thanks, he's the one that was made note of. And this is why we have to give testimony. It's why we have to give praise to God. It's why we have to not only say that we have faith to bring it forward, but when it's answered, we have to have faith to acknowledge it. Pride would say, oh, you did that yourself. Oh, you knew you were getting a refund, so it was, no. By faith, you put it out there, and then the refund comes. You know, I told you that story about the man driving around, driving around, driving around, begging God to give him a parking space, and when he finally sees a parking space, he goes, ah, no thanks, I don't need your help, I found one, as if he found it on his own. And so we tend to do that, and God doesn't want us to do that. He honors, honors it when you give him. And so the 12 leaders of these tribes, remember, these are the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, 11 of them whose names were God is my rock and God is my peace. But the 12th one was, what was his Hebrew name mean? Brother of evil. He was the type and shadow of Judas Iscariot, right there in the tabernacle. The twelfth, nun, twelfth one's name in Hebrew meant brother of evil. How interesting that surrounding God were twelve. Surrounding God were twelve. One of them was the brother of evil. Right there in the tabernacle. A foreshadowing of what was going to come at that last supper table. At that Passover Seder. When one would prove himself to be the brother of evil. So God shows us these things if we're willing to look. It's all there. It's always been there always been there that everyone wanted to look so when they had brought them before the tabernacle the lord said to moses accept these gifts these from accept these from them for use in the service of the tent of meeting and give them to the levites according to their respective services so what brought into the tabernacle what's brought into the storehouse is for the use of the service of the congregation of the tent of meeting this is why you have me and you have our financial board. That the tithes and offerings, well, how do you determine this and how do you determine that? We determine it by need. 
We set up a budget, and for those of you who are at the annual meeting, you heard the process and you saw the numbers. How do you get to the annual meeting? You're faithful in your tithe, your time, and your talent. Well, Rabbi, I tithe, but you don't serve. I'm not a member in good standing. Well, I come to services and, and I serve, but I, I don't tithe fully. I'm not a member in good standing. There's a definition in our bylaws of a member in good standing. It's by invitation only, and if you're not invited, it's because there's something in your membership here which let you, had you fall short of an invitation. It's how we do it. And so if you want to be at the next meeting, you have to be faithful in all three areas of your life here. Faithful in your time, got to come to services. Faithful in your talent, You've got to serve. You've got to put that to use for the kingdom. And faithful in your tithe. Now, we don't do audits. But if you give nothing, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that that's not your tithe. And so that's how we operate. And so those who came saw the whole system. And it was one praise report after another. Because it's fully used for the service of the congregation. This was God's pattern. Accept these from them for use in the service of the tent of meeting and give them to the Levites according to their respective services. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two carts and four oxen he gave to the Gershonites as required for their service. And four carts and eight oxen he gave to the Merarites as required for their service under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest. But to the Kohathites he did not give any since theirs was the service of the most sacred objects. Their porterage was by shoulder. This is a practical distribution. If you have to carry these items and you need to carry all the skins and you need to carry the big stuff, you need carts and oxen to haul that around, don't you? Okay, it's logical, it's practical, adjudication, allocation of resources. Who needs what, what goes to whom? But for this group, because they carried everything on their shoulder, they didn't need oxen. They didn't need carts. What was this, favoritism? Oh, well, how come they got six of this and four of that, and I didn't get anything? Because you didn't need it. God gives according to each one, according to their need, not their want. He didn't ask, hey, guys, come on up and tell me what you'd like to have out of the big pot. We've got all this stuff now. We've got these carts, and we've got these oxen, and we've got all this stuff laid out here. Come on, tell me what you want. How many do you, hey, Robin, how many did you want? Okay, four. You wanted four, but what do you need four for? Oh, well, that's not the point. Yeah, go ahead, take the four. And then how some operations run, it's, you know, it's the pecking order, it's this, oh, well, I've got this real big need, budgets are done that way in corporations, oh, i got this need, or if you don't use it, you don't get it the next year. A pretty foolhardy system that is. So it just causes people to spend money on things they don't actually need. On God's system, he says, I'll give according to each one according to their need. Are we getting warm now? Yeah, Jim, we need some stir up a little air if you can, please. Even if it's just the fan right now. The chieftains also brought the dedication offering for the altar upon its being anointed. As the chieftains were presenting their offering before the altar, the Lord said to Moses, let them present their offerings for the dedication of the altar, one chieftain each day. So for 12 days, the chieftains brought these offerings. Where do you think they got the offerings? From the people, from the members of each one of their tribal groups. Do they take up an offering? Do they have a big fund drive? Do they take up a big campaign? No, I would suspect it probably went like this. Guys, we need to bring something to the Lord. Okay, well, here's what I have. Everybody take out, there's a pencil in your pew in front of you. Everybody take one out. Is there a little pencil there? No pencil? Yeah, there's a pencil. Hold it up in the air. Okay, all of you kind of hold it where you can read it. All right, and if you would, on the count of three, read it out loud. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. God loves a cheerful giver. And we put that on there as a reminder that God loves it. Don't give out a compulsion. 
Don't give because you feel like you're under pressure to give. God loves a cheerful giver. Here is where this concept prevailed. As they left Egypt, God had proclaimed that people were going to pour out upon you more than you could possibly need. And the people, the people that had persecuted them for 400 years, come running out and giving them bracelets off their, here, take this, and, and here's my ring, and, and, my, and my necklace, and, and my pots, and my pans, and all this. Take this, my silver, my gold, my jewelry. Take it, bless you, bless you, bless you. Go, go, go. And now they get out in the desert, and they've got all this stuff. And the opportunity now comes to pay it forward, to bless the Lord, to bless the works of his hand, to give it for the support of the tent of meeting, where what comes out of the tent of meeting? Forgiveness. That place where you bring your offerings so you can be forgiven, so you're not separated, you're not put out of the camp. Things happen. You've got hundreds of thousands of people. You have two million people encamped. You have a city a major metropolitan city. Can you imagine reading in the headlines in the Birmingham News that this city of, what, one million in the metro population? Last night, for the last 24 hours, we're happy to report that there was not a single crime, not a single offense, not a single harsh word spoken. Nobody got angry, nobody got hurt. No traffic accidents, no problems, nobody shortchanged, nobody insulted. Nothing happened in the city of Birmingham today worth noting. The biggest piece of news is everybody's getting along. Everybody's happy. The world is a perfect place. Is it even conceivable that that can happen in your home? In your car on the way to Bible study? You know that old prayer, Lord, so far today I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't lied to anybody, I haven't offended anybody, I have not slandered your name, I have not committed a sin, Lord, and I'm just about to get out of bed. And... <laughs> Isn't that the way it is? So imagine two million, million people, you've got to have a system for bringing repentance and bringing forgiveness and bringing reconciliation and bringing absolution and bringing equity and bringing a balance and bringing a system where shalom can be in the home. So why wouldn't you want to bring honor and glory to the source of peace? Willingly, cheerfully, where are you going to give your money? Where are you going to put where your heart is and what? Where your treasure? Isn't that the whole process? So their heart was with the Lord. That was their treasure. Did they need an extra bracelet? Did they need an extra ring? But here it was for the service of the tabernacle to bless the Levites and the Kohathites and all those that were doing all the work of the tabernacle and making sure that the altar was prepared properly that God would receive the offering. You know, all the things they did to Yeshua, they did biblically, so that God saw that the offering had been fully prepared. Oh yeah, he was beaten, and he was spit upon, and he was shouted down, and all these things were done to him, as it was foretold prophetically in the Bible that it would happen, so there'd be no mistaking that the preparation of the sacrifice had been made complete. And why pierce his body? because they will look upon the one whom they pierced. And without blood, there is no remission of sin. And so all this had to be in order to be fully prepared. Well, if the full preparation wasn't there, if all the piece parts weren't together, it would be incomplete. We look on the Day of Atonement of going behind the curtain and doing all these things. It had to be done a certain way, prescribed way, in order for it to be made complete. Otherwise, it wouldn't be accepted. Well, all those that were responsible for the preparation, all those who did all the legwork, how many of you noticed the shiny floors, the newly waxed condition of the congregation and freshening up of all the things around here and new paint over here and all these things? Well, we walk right by it and we know something's good, but we don't know what it is. Well, we take time and we look and say, wow, all these floors have been freshly waxed. They've been stripped after 25 years and resurfaced and Somebody had to do that work in the preparation of making this place better. 
But we go about our business and we don't pay attention to the little things like that. I do because that's my job. But giving to those, to support those that do this kind of work in the preparation of making sure that the place Look at all the lights, all the lights always on, all the lights, a bulb goes out, the next time you come, the bulb is fixed. Bulb goes out, the next time you come, the bulb is fixed. Somebody has to bring in scaffolding and climb up there and do all these things, the people who are supposed to do it, not the people that want to help do it, but the people that actually are supposed to do it. And so it gets done and it works and we come in and it lights up and it's beautiful. It's clean, and the lights have changed from yellow to white, and did anybody notice the lights change from yellow to white? And all of a sudden, the congregation is brighter at night. And not only is it brighter at night, but when we pull the lights down for worship, it's darker. It's a bigger contrast. It has a bigger effect. All those things in the preparation, those are your tithes and offerings being used to prepare a place where we know that God is pleased because His presence is here. We want to make it that way. And this is what the tabernacle was all about, a place where God would want to be in accordance with his design. And so you brought it into the storehouse. This is what you did with it for the service of the tent of meeting. The one who presented his offering on the first day was Nashon, son of Amminadab of the tribe of Judah. Here was his offering, one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver basin of 70 shekels by the sanctuary weight, both filled with choice flour with oil mixed in for a meal offering, one gold ladle of 10 shekels filled with incense, one bull of the herd, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one goat for a sin offering, and for his sacrifice of well-being, two oxen, Five rams, five he goats, and five yearly lambs. This was the offering of Nashon, son of Amminadab. Hmm. Didn't he already tell us it was Nashon, son of Amminadab? Why does he want to tell us again? It's one paragraph. And this is God's word. This is God's defined and prescribed word. He says, "These is how this is, I want you to tell my story. These are the words I want you to use. So I want you to make a record. I want you to make a note that it was Nashon, son of Amminadab, that brought this, and he was the first one. This is in the order. And we remember we look at the order around the tabernacle, and we look at the order of the way the tribes were set up. This was the first, and this is in order. Order is still the same. This is how the order is, and it's always the same. Same way that when they recounted the sons of Jacob, it was always in a particular order. And when Joseph had him sit, it was in a particular order of age. And we see all this because God's the God of order. And he puts things in order, and he does it that way to remind us and remind us and remind us that the same doesn't mean old and busted. Because if the same meant old and busted, then our liturgy would be old and busted. Then the Lord's Prayer would be old and busted. And the Bible would be old and busted, because the last time I checked, the Bible began the same way every time I opened the Bible. So if the same means stable, consistent, powerful, with authority. I want to remain the same in certain areas. How many of you have ever climbed a mountain or used a carabiner or, or ropes or things like that? The, you put a carabiner in the same way every time, don't you? Make sure it's secure. And if you have it secure, you can go any height or almost any depth, right? Because you know it's secured and it's tied off the same way, right? Do you get creative with carabiners? No, you don't. How many of you have ever gone skydiving? You get creative packing your chute? Okay. No, you do it the same way, don't you? All right. How many of you drive your car sitting in front of the steering wheel? Six of you. Okay. I, I, I've, se I've seen you drive. No, we do it the same way because it works. How many of you get creative with the way you drive? Now, I confess that I can drive pretty well with my knees. Uh, as many of you can, can you turn a corner? I finally projected that. Okay. Practice in the parking lot a lot. Okay. I can't back up as well with my knees as I can. You know, but, but when you're going 60 miles an hour, it's okay. Celeste, right? 
but the point is, is that consistent and stable works. And God's word is consistent and stable. He gives us his name twice, and he repeats the names twice because he wants you to know your name is important. He keeps a record of who you are. He knows you by name. He knew Nashon by name. Why do you think he doesn't know you by name? You all are mentioned in the Bible, every one of you. Every one of you, by name. He's called you his children. You're the seed, the promise. And because of that, he shows us this pattern. He repeats every name twice because he wants us to know that he knows our name. It matters. He has a record. David had a record of all the people that served with him. Throughout the Bible, we see records and census and recordings of names. Oh, don't we read about the Lamb's Book of Life? If your name is inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life, doesn't that mean that there's a book, there's a record, there's something that God's going to turn to? We've got a, somebody with a microphone, we've got a hand up. <clears throat> right there, Joyce. Uh, isn't it in the book of Genesis that said that uh, when a matter happens twice that it's fixed in the mind of God? Absolutely. See, these are the things that record for all time. Permanent record. Permanent record. When you were born, did you get a birth certificate? If your name is not Obama. <laughs> but, but everybody else gets a birth certificate. Right? How many of you have two birth dates? How many of you have two birth dates? Okay. Do you have a certificate from it? Okay. If you were baptized for mikvah, you get a certificate. We give you a mikvah certificate. Okay. So you have two documents recorded. Your physical birth, your spiritual birth. Okay. A birth certificate. Okay. It's got your same name on it, doesn't it? Why is it recorded twice? Do we need to record it twice? We do record it twice. This is a pattern. Okay, I have two names. I have Eric Elmer Walker as my American name, and Avraham Mendel Bear Ben Hirsch as my Hebrew name. I have two names, as tradition would have it for every Jewish boy has two names. Both are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. God keeps records. How can we be held accountable for every word that comes from our mouth if we can't associate those words with a name? So God knows your name. He tells us all throughout his word that he knows our name. All throughout his word. He recorded each name and each gift indicates his love for and his interest in the individual. See, if each one of you came and brought $10 forward, I would make a list and say, okay, Gail Daniels, $10. Levy Montgomery, $10. Okay, I wouldn't just say everybody brought $10. I would put down the name and the amount, the name and the amount, the name and the amount, the name and the amount. Even if every one of you brought the same amount, it would be an individual recording of your gift. Why? Because each one of you should be acknowledged before God for what you've contributed. Each one of you should be acknowledged for, before God for what you've done for him. Each one of you brings a different gift into the house of the Lord. And God acknowledges that. Now in the pattern in the desert, each one bought an individual gift. Happened to be the same amount. But God took the time each day to recognize twice by name. Was this just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive? How long does it take for us to get it? How long does it take to, for us to get the message that we matter to God? That he's not this big old giant God up there that just says, oh, I just run things up here from my big control panel, from my command central. No, I hear you, Robin, when you say I don't have enough to pay my taxes. And I hear you, Nancy, when you say I really want to move next door to my son and my grandchildren because I don't want to drive anymore at night. Because that's the real desire of your heart. And if I want to go over and see him at night, I can't anymore. Because your life has changed. 
And so if I can just walk next door, I don't care what time of day it is, I can be with my family. God knows that's your heart. But he wants to hear you say it. Abba, I, I can't drive anymore. I don't feel safe driving at night anymore. And I don't want to be away from my family. It means I can only see my family during daytime when the kids are in school and they got this. And so my time with them is short. And he hears your cry. And he honors that. Because that's really the desire of your heart. It's not about selling a house or buying a house. It's about being reunited with your family so you can see them in the hours in which you have available, but you can't drive. That's God's heart for you. Because he knows you by name. He knows your circumstance. He's just waiting for you to ask him. So you can write it down and say, oh, now Nancy wants to, oh, I knew all along I was just waiting on her. Didn't God know all along what people were going to bring him and how they were going to bring it and how they were going to do it and where they were going to get it and who was going to give it? He knew all that. But he puts his record into place to remind us. See, because this is the word of God available to all of us to see God's heart. How does he show us his heart? How does he show us the mind of God? How does he show us the patterns that he wants us to recognize? How does he want us to be acknowledged? And then how does he want us to apply that by acknowledging others? You know, the, the, the difficulty for every leader is when you open up the pulpit and you acknowledge one person by name and you forget one person. Okay, so then the tendency is, is never to acknowledge anybody by name. Because if you don't acknowledge everybody by name, you've left somebody out and you've hurt somebody's feelings. And so everything that was well intended gets now turned around and somebody gets offended. And so then what happens now? Nobody gets acknowledged because that's the solution. Well, guess what? I'm going to continue to acknowledge you by name and I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm probably going to forget somebody and I'm going to ask you to forgive me and just please come and remind me and say, hey, I helped too. And I'll go, hey, Gerald, I'm so sorry I left you out, man. It was completely my error. But yes, Gerald Hand just cleared all that property by hand. Okay? And he spent seven months of his life doing it and it's now beautiful and it's now a park over there. And if you'd like to contribute by building some, some uh, park benches and some picnic tables, we're going to put a whole picnic area out there on the area that he cleared by hand. And it's gorgeous and it's now it's green and lush and it's been maintained and it's beautiful and it's going to stay beautiful. And that's because God gave him a vision and he went out there every day. And did a little at a time, a little at a time, and persevered, persevered. Now, many people helped him, and I didn't call them out by name. And they're going to tell me, you helped him. Raise your hand if you helped him, and I'm going to call you out by name. Just remind me. You know, I'm getting to the point in about seven months where I get to hit that senior moment excuse. Okay? <laughs> so just prepare yourselves, because it's coming. At age 60, I'm going to hit it, and I'm going to hit it big. Okay? It's going to be added to the repertoire. Huh? What's that? I know it doesn't make any difference, but if I can get away with it. <laughs> you know, if they're going to forgive me, if they're going to indulge me for the white beard and the 60, then, you know, you know, if I can, if, I'll try it and see if it flies. It probably won't fly. They'll bust me on it, but you know what? You can't blame me for trying. So we look at this first day, and God has an order, and he does it one a day, and he tells us this story. He tells it to us 12 times, and is it because he's forgetful? It's because he wants to remind you, he wants to reinforce it to us that your gift matters. And even if your gift is the same as the other person's gift, your gift matters just as much as theirs individually and separately. And collectively, it just increases. But God wants us to remind us of that. He knows our names, he's recorded them individually. When we stand before God, what happens? Do we all die together? Rarely. Rarely. So that means when you stand before the throne of the Lord, don't you want him to say your name? You do. And so God keeps records. And he knows us by name. He'll see us individually, and then every man says every knee will bend. And every tongue will profess that Yeshua is Lord. Every, every individual one at a time. No collective profession of faith. It's got to be individual. It's got to be individual. No mind control, no, 
Kool-Aid. We don't serve Kool-Aid here at Holy Grounds. It's for a purpose. Royal Cup makes coffee. They don't make Kool-Aid. <laughs> so on the second day, Nathaniel, son of Zuar, chieftain of Issachar, made his offering. He presented as his offering one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver basin of 70 shekels by the sanctuary weight. Now, why is that always added? Remember, there's many scripture references to a false balance, a false weight system is an abomination before God. When I measure what you bring versus what somebody else brings, it's got to be on the same scale, the same standard. Isn't it interesting that God says bring a tithe? The standard is a tithe, a tenth. He doesn't say an amount of money, he just says a tithe. A uniform standard in which is equally measured across and equally applied across the board. A tenth is 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 a tenth. It's consistent. It's according to the tenth. It's one tenth. It's not a sliding scale of increase by increase. If you make a million dollars, it's a tenth. If you make a dollar, it's a tenth. It's a consistent standard of scale. And God establishes that early on that says there is a scale, there is a standard, and we need to establish what it is. How many remember what this is from here to here? Cubit. Okay. Who's cubit? Okay, it's my cubit. What's your cubit like? Okay. It's different, isn't it? Okay. So when we establish, when he said to Noah, I want you to make an ark, and I want it to be X amount of cubits long, whose cubit was he talking about? Noah's. And when they built the temple... He had to assign somebody to be in charge because that was what was going to establish what the cubit was. You can't have 100 people and say, okay, everybody cut your board to a cubit. So I'm there measuring mine. And go, okay, I stack them all up and they're all over the place. Okay, because it's not a standard measure unless I establish the standard of the measure. Now today the shekel is a different value. How many of you know about commodities? We just did exchanges in... Uh, in the Ukraine, and in the Ukraine, the grivna is the denomination, is the currency, and the grivna is not expect, accepted in any other part of the world. So you can't take and go to any country. You can't go to Belarus and use the grivna. Okay, it's only within the Ukraine. So you come to the Ukraine, you get grivna. When you leave the Ukraine, you leave your grivna behind. And we watched, and they have digital exchange boards. And literally, I don't know if you were standing there, but it went from 798 to 794 when 20 of us were getting ready to walk in the door. I mean, the moment this whole group lined up outside the exchange place, all the signs on the street changed. They went from 798 for a dollar to 794 to the dollar. It's all controlled, all digitally controlled. I don't know if they see groups coming, if they see you coming out of a tourist hotel, okay, but boom, it changed. After we exchanged the money, 798. Very interesting system, okay, but you're pretty much held captive. Oh, it happened to be a good rate, okay, but it was a standard rate, but it fluctuated every day. Some places we went, it was 794, some places it was 795, some places it was 796, depending on the day and the currency trading. So it was inconsistent. It was, it was changing, constantly changing. But it was an interlinked system, and you couldn't go shop the rate. They were all connected. So if you were a currency exchange place, you had to honor that rate as it was publicized. So there was a standard weight to it, a standard value to it. Now, in Israel, when you, when you uh, go to exchange for the shekel, right, it's, uh, it's, it's fun, it's actually, uh, you know, uh, it's like uh, a game played by Jewish adults, you know, in negotiating exchange rates. If you're going to Israel with us, you'll have fun when we go to the exchange counter, okay? When you hear uh, Israelis talk, you would think that a battle was going to ensue. You're waiting for weapons to come out, and, right? It gets very loud, doesn't it? You know, you've been there a number of times, and it can be, negotiations can be very loud, and usually a vein here <laughs> and a, one vein here, okay, is usually involved, right? Right? Okay.
okay, and you think somebody's going to have a coronary, okay, <laughs> over a meal, right? You know, usually in the diamond exchanges and the areas like that or in the stores, but, uh, and then they walk out and they got their arms around each other and they're talking about a ball game or something like that because business is business. Nothing personal and you got to fight. You got to fight the fight. But God establishes a balance. He says a, a, a system that everybody is consistently measured on. That's why when it comes time for the prayer of salvation, when it comes time to accepting God's plan of atonement, it's not a wishy-washy, inconsistent plan that's flexible and negotiable and all these things. It's a clearly established plan that he put into place that says, this is how you are received in the kingdom. Based upon this plan that I put in place, I know you want it to be multiple paths, and I know you want it to go this way, and I know you'd really like to get in through, through this, and you know somebody, and you know the mater d' into heaven, and you know you can get a good table, and you can get in without having to do this, but you can't. Because God shows us a pattern of consistency. He shows us his consistency. You know, I was asked the question on the air yesterday. It was very upsetting to the person asking me, are you telling me that these things going on in the world today are connected with, a, with the world's stand against Israel? And I said, I am. He said, so you're telling me that God is punishing nations because of their stand against Israel? And I said, I am. She said, I cannot conceive of a God who would punish people. I said, then you don't know God. God's the God of choices. A gentleman is a gentleman of choices. I give many of you choices. They say, oh, Rabbi, you're so heavy-handed. And I say, I give you a choice. I give you a decision. Take it or leave it. That is a choice. <laughs> like it or dislike it. That is a choice. I'm not saying you have to like it. You can dislike it. You still have to do it. But, <laughs> but in God's economy, and I explained it on the air, and here's what I said. I said, you remember the show, Let's Make a Deal? Monty Hall, three doors. And they were always so gracious to open one door for you. You remember that? Let's show you what's behind door number three. Okay, door number three is a pig and a poke, and whew, really glad I didn't pick that one. Okay, but now you're left with two choices, and here's the doors. Here's eternal separation from God, and here's eternal God, a presence with God. Pick your door. If I make the choice to be eternally separated from God, I'm going to live with the consequences of my choice. He's the guy, he didn't force you to choose his door. He laid the choices out in front of you, calling you to make a decision. But if you don't choose that path, you have chosen another path. God's very clear about order and decision and what he wants. And he's telling us this is the way it's to be prepared, this is the way it's to be received. And so when it comes time to stand before the Lord, and he sees us as individuals, oh, but I went to Bethel. I listened to all the teachings. I did everything I was supposed to do. Yeah, you did it all the way up to the point of decision. I believe he's the God of chances. But I believe that there is a final chance that he gives. And once the decision is made and your final rejection comes, it is a final rejection. You know, I believe in those moments before death when the heart stops but the mind goes on. My belief, my personal belief, my personal opinion is that's where he meets each one of us. He shows us the lures of our life and he shows us the decision that we've made. And he says, are you sure you want to go down this path? I'd like to believe that my God is that kind of loving God that's going to give me that final chance. But that final chance is the final chance. Otherwise, then the book of God is a lie. And if one part of it is not true, all of it's not true. If one part of it is not all there is to know, then none of it is. If there is no plan of salvation, if there's not a plan of atonement, if there is no place to bring a sacrifice, if there is no place to be forgiven, then none of us are forgiven. But if there is a plan and the plan gives us a choice, we all have to make that choice. For some, it's a very hard choice. I'd rather leave behind the world and inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
than have the world and lose the kingdom of heaven. Nobody, none of you mattered to me that much to choose you over God. Nobody in my family matters to me that much to choose them over God. Nobody. The puppies don't even come close. <laughs> right, honey? And I love you a lot, but I would, I would be sending you to the pit of despair if I chose you over God. That would curse our marriage and curse our life. So I don't want that for my family. So one silver basin of 70 shekels by the sanctuary weight, both filled with choice flour with oil mixed in for a meal offering, one golden ladle of 10 shekels filled with incense, one bull of the herd, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one goat for a sin offering and for a sacrifice of well-being, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs. That was the offering of Nathaniel, son of Zuar. So we see this pattern being repeated. We see this pattern being repeated because God wants to show us very clearly that each one of us matters specifically, severally, completely, individually, and collectively. That the gift we bring is duly noted even if it's the same gift as the person before you. And a complete record is kept of your gift item by item not relative or comparative, complete accounting, a standalone accounting without adding to it, oh, that it was cleaner, it was nicer, it was bigger, it was shinier, it was this, it was that. Here's the weight, the size, and the weight. And as we bring our offerings before the Lord, and you remember the widow's might. And here was the reference point. These gave out of their wealth, but she gave all she had. And God looks at that. And he looks as we stand before him, are we doing our part? Not somebody else's part, not more than our part. We don't have to do more than our part. The people with the gift of of giving, uh, spiritual gift of giving, or voluntary poverty are the ones that say, I live less than my means because I want to give more to the kingdom of God. It's a powerful gift. It's not one that people volunteer for, but people have. Many of you have that gift. That you live below your income level so that you have more to give to the kingdom. Some of you don't own homes, could own homes, but you choose not to. You choose to live in a room, rent a room, because you can give more to the kingdom. You can give more to other people because you don't need more. You're willing to live on what it is that you need, not on what you want, because you want to support other people. And so in God's economy, he shows us that these standards are in place, each one giving according to what they could. God loves a cheerful giver. He shows us this pattern for the support of what? Not the individual. He doesn't really care about the support of the individual. He cares more about the body, the whole body, all of you collectively. That's why we have a Joseph Storehouse. That's why we have benevolence. That's why we sponsor and scholarship and give and do the things we have so that the body is edified, the body is lifted up. Your spiritual gifts are not to be used for your own edification, but for the edification of the body, to bring it into the congregation so that the congregation may grow, that the unity, that the compounding of one becomes so large and so bright Each one of you is an individual candle or one candle power, but you 200, 300 together become 300 candle power. That you can see from a distance. And in a thousand candle power, that you can see as a spotlight. And in a million candle power, it's a searchlight. And in a billion candle power, it's a quasar. And this is what God's calling us to do. He's calling us to come together in unity to be that brighter light. Not about our individual lights, but that collective light that burns so bright that the world will finally notice. And what did Yeshua say? I am the light of the world. And God's giving us this pattern to bring it in for kingdom work. The tent of meeting represents the kingdom of God. It's where he dwelled. And just because now there is a certain separation between us and him because his presence is not here, doesn't mean we can't call his presence down to occupy this space and time at all times when we call upon the Holy Spirit. We open every service. We welcome the Holy Spirit here. God is in this place. God is in this place. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we've hit 11.56. We're going to start getting ready for our Hebrew class. God bless you. Please pray for all those.